we wanted to do this webinar series to really address some of the fundamentals and some of the issues that people face that I've found in my career across indirect materials in different industries, um, you know, whether you're whether manufacturing or you're mining or you're assembling or you're distributing, the, 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 the MRO space is the same. That's probably one thing that you notice is people think, do you have oil and gas experience? Well, for MRO, it really doesn't matter. It's the same approach if it's a, if it's a bearing for an oil and gas company or if it's a bearing for a, a cookie manufacturer. The, the thought concept in cataloging and maintaining MRO materials from creation through procurement through to consumption is, is effectively the same. Um, so in saying that, that, that affects you know, effectively trillions of dollars of spare parts around the globe. And, and there's so many companies that need assistance in this space. So we thought we would develop this series and help people on this journey on what things we to think about as we implement our tool across companies. These are the things that we see. So as I've kind of touched on, the purpose is to help these, to help create the building, the fundamentals of MRO materials. You know, the M and the R are one thing, and then you have your O, your operating supplies, which can be very different in understanding what you catalog, when you catalog, why you catalog. And obviously the, the objective of this is to help people, it's from a basically two key points is to drive efficiency into business process. Cause I think anybody that has dealt in the indirect space, the amount of noise that can be created when you have inefficient processes is significant, um, affecting many different roles within the business for silly little things that hold up the creation of material or the purchasing of a material or the delivery of material. And that leads us into definitely the cost. Now there's a few examples I'll probably pop in here and there from my experience, especially in the mining world where MRO and spare parts are a very, very large portion of the working capital. And so we spent a lot of time understanding these materials, their risks, the criticality, what do we need, what do we not need, um, and driving inefficiencies out of the business through optimization. And that all, all started from the, um, the catalog, the, the material master data. So in saying that, we've developed um, this series and we're welcome for feedback. These are the things that I've noticed through my journeys that are, are definitely impacting on the environment. Um, for, first off is cataloging. How do I catalog a material? What's the right way to do it? Dictionaries, taxonomies, noun modifiers, UNS, PSC, ISO standards. All these things can be very confusing and overwhelming. So we'll try to put some structure around that today and some thought process to help you. Um, then we've um, coming up later in some series, we're gonna look at, you know, how do you manage, well, how do you identify and manage duplicate materials, which is completely built off today's session. Um, then one of my, um, one of my arch enemies is a uh, free tech spend. And how do we, how do we reduce free tech spend so that we, we create material master data that can capture that controllable spend to reduce cost and, you know, stocking the right parts. Uh, that'll lead into potentially looking at, you know, stocking strategies. How do I know what should I stock and what do I not stock? How closely do I include my maintenance and engineering teams on this journey? And then that leads straight into where I, I put a lot more focus on the procurement and procurement master data, especially in the ERP system that you use. Now I've, I've spent most of my working career in, in SAP. So I may throw out a few SAP terms here and there. So if you're not an SAP, you know, pardon me for that, but procurement is one area um, that needs a lot more effort in the master data space. You know, we, um, we talk a lot around um, inventory management and asset management um, master data, but not a lot around procurement master data because there is procurement master data that drives the automation and efficiency that's driven from things like an SAP, um, an info record and how important they are. So feel free to send through if there's other topics that you want to potentially hear about or have us discuss, please add it in the, um, in the, in the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, and we'll look at considering that for future webinars if that's things that uh, are of interest. 
Okay, so I've uh, I've got a couple daughters that are 15, and they're heavily into algebra and you know trigonometry and things like that. So I'm trying to get out of my head the 4w and plus 1h makes me think of their maths. So I thought to give us a bit of structure, it's it's good to think of things. Well, what do I need to catalog? When do I need to catalog it? Where do I get it cataloged? In house, out of house, and why am I cataloging it? It seems very simple, but I think we can all understand when you've dealt in the um, in the indirect materials. These are all pertinent questions, especially when you're trying to explain this to senior management or the cost controllers or people that you're trying to influence to get a project underway for this master data. For example, the company a company that I um, I worked for in my in my past. Uh, pretty immature in the indirect material space. They were focused purely on manufacturing. All the effort and resources went there. But I, I developed a slide and showed the executive team, um, the board, that I think it surprised them. We showed them that in the indirect material space, I owned 99%. I was their further out. I was their first warehousing inventory manager. I owned 99% of the SKUs and 40, 40 to 50, depending on the month, percent of the total working capital tied up within the business. That's finished goods, raw materials. So effectively your direct and your indirect materials. And I think that got their attention, especially when I told them about half of the indirect working capital wasn't required, or is at a stage now that was probably obsolete. And that is significant working capital and cash tied up and in today's world with COVID, the pandemic, um, global economic concerns, this, this is gonna be a, a growing priority is how do you cut cost and put cash into the business? So that leads us into number one. The, the state, straight away you need to understand, you need to create a dictionary so you have a cataloging strategy. And now we're gonna talk about that through these four whys and then at the end, the how. So your dictionary is really made up of your taxonomy or your classification. So you think of your dictionary as your, your noun modifiers. Your noun modifiers are generally really, or in a lot of companies, link them to your UNSPSC codes. That helps drive um, potentially, if you're NSAP material groups, spend analysis, um, and alignment to international standards. So that's that's good. We like to see that with your, your, your noun modifier, very important, and restricting those so they don't get out of control. And that, then underneath that are all your attributes and your classification that define your parts. And while we do this, we've, we've very much aligned ourselves with ECMA. So the Electronic Commerce Code Management Association. So this is a nonprofit organization, and I'll show some more in the next slide, that have developed the ISO standards in this space. And so it's, it's important that this isn't something that you realize this isn't something you should do on your own. Start looking at alignment globally. Um, the new ISO, well, newish is relative, but ISO 8000 is looking to standardize naming conventions and cataloging standards globally. So the more you align yourself to that um, ISO standard, the better off you'll be in the long run and have to do less changing and, and uh, probably recataloging it in some cases. Some companies I've seen, you know, they recatalog, recatalog, recatalog because they haven't implemented a governance and compliance standard moving forward. So ideally, you need to define how am I going to move forward? But before I do that, we need to clean up what we have. And so you shouldn't just clean up, move forward, clean up again, move forward. Think about cleaning up and then how am I gonna control my catalog and my governance and compliance standards going forward? So we'll, we'll discuss that and hopefully um, provide a bit of clarity and, 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 and feel free to you know, just Google ECMA and have a look through that. It's I, I'm more than happy to help you in that space. Okay, so there's two main standards that link into the work that we do, and it's the ISO 22745 and then ISO 8000. And so let me just give you some more information here. Um, and as we mentioned, a lot of companies that do not have the resources, like the company I just referred to that I work for, 
they very much underappreciated that working capital tied up in spare parts because it was viewed as the necessary evil. I've just got to have those things. But because their view is very nonchalant, there is a lot of waste and a lot of under-resourcing to manage and maintain those materials, especially after you purchase them. So preservation activities, things like that. And so there's a lot of work in thinking, well, it, it is hard it's, if, if you don't have the resources, but this is, this is what we do. We help align this and get this um, thought process in place and manage these materials. So I'm just gonna, let me bring up some of this information that I've just kind of mentioned so you can see. So the, um, the EOTD, so that's the Open Technical Dictionary. Very, very handy. Um, so it's, it, the thing is about used, in, used to create unambiguous language for independent description of goods and services. So the point there is you're not alone. You have help and resources in trying to define your dictionary and understanding how is the world treating these materials. That's, that's a handy document to have um, along with the, the DRR. The E is just for electronic. Um, meaning the, a lot of the stuff that ECMA do and provide is portable. When they say portable, it's not linked to a software, okay? This is usable in any software, and that's why they have the XML on the, the little pictures there. And that's the point. The standard is not tied to one piece of software that you have to buy or purchase or use. This is a nonprofit organization. Um, and those, the ISO 22745, very much links into ISO 8000, um, which as you can see the information there. So that becomes um, your material master records against each existing records to be screened. So anyway, so that's, those are things to consider. If you haven't looked in those, please do have a look. Uh, I think there's a bit more here. Yeah, there's open texture dictionary, your data requirements and your shared master data. And the ISO 8000 is the one I think that you'll, that will impact all indirect materials globally going forward. Over time, it will take time, but this is where everybody will be aligned. I won't go into the detail. Please go into 115 and you can Google it. You'll, you'll find a bit more information on that. You can start understanding how this information in ECMA can help you defining your dictionary. Okay, so for the first W, think about what should or should be cataloged. It's, it's, it's amazing. This question comes up in it all the time. We're engineering or, or maintenance or procurement or finance people saying, well, what, what should we catalog in our business and what should we not? It takes a lot of effort. It's hard work. There's all this master data I don't understand. So I try to, I try to step back and it, depending on who you're trying to influence and say, there's three main things you need to consider or three pillars, as I say, three core pieces. And one is your demand signal. And this is really for indirect materials, as you'll know, it comes from generally maintenance and engineering. And you'll have operations having demand on your indirect materials, especially your operating supplies. And that the, a main driver in what you catalog and what you don't and how you treat them from a strategy perspective is think about how planned is your business from an, from an indirect material consumption, the demand signal you're receiving, how planned is it? So do you know what is going to be consumed next week? And if you do, what percentage of it is planned? 20%, 80% makes a very, very big difference. So I, I say that straight away is maintenance teams are planning as best they can, but how much of it actually sticks and how much of it is unplanned? So there's they, they plan to do a job today, but you know, half the materials they realize they need more once they go to do the job. So that becomes, you've got half planned and half unplanned. The more unplanned you have means the more cost you need to carry in the warehouse stocking materials. And that comes at a cost, a very, very big cost. Some businesses, we run to failure. That's, that's our strategy. We're not gonna worry about all this. We're just gonna stock a lot of parts because our equipment is simple, it's not complicated, and we'll just run to failure and we'll fix it as we go. Versus other companies, they can't afford equipment to shut down like pulp and paper or oil and gas or process industries, they, you know, a shutdown is extremely expensive. So um, that's the first one, is understanding how reliant, how 
how secure is your demand signal? Next, I, I like to think about what is your ability to procure the materials that are required from the demand signal? And you can, two and three can be, you can swap them around, but you need to think what, what's the performance of my suppliers? Um, are they local? Are they overseas? And in today's world, which is changing quickly, a lot of suppliers are global. You may order locally, but it's actually procured internationally. So that affects your lead times. Lead time is very, very, very important. Um, lead times, is, I could probably talk on lead times in, a, in a, a session all by itself. Lead time is very, very misunderstood in terms of from the point the demand is identified to the point you have goods, that's lead time. But there's so many little components that make up that time. Some demand is generated. How long does it take to the requisition get created? Your requisition may need to be released. Your rec they're released into a purchase order. Purchase orders may be, need to be released. It's transmitted to your supplier. How long does it take your supplier to acknowledge that order, to process the order? Do they manufacture the order? Do they have it in stock? Then they have to dispatch it. Then you have logistics. Then you have receiving. All those components make up the lead time. And that's generally very misunderstood. Um, procurement capability, another one is, is automation. So depending on the size of your company and the, the, the capability, as I say, of your procurement team and their skill, how much do you automate? So I like to say a perfect order, a perfect purchase order has two touch points. And you can measure that with, with, with transactional data. The nice thing is you can measure that. So think about a perfect order is the demand signal is created. The next time you do anything to that order is your goods receipt it. To me, that's the perfect order. But think about how many times generally you touch a purchase order in between. So you maybe you have to create it manually. Maybe you have to release things manually. Then you have to expedite manually. Then you've got to um, maybe get PODs because they say they've delivered it, but you don't have it. Then you've got to find things in the warehouse. Then you finally receive it and then deliver it. The difference between a perfect order and a not perfect order is significant and a lot of cost is wrapped up in that and personnel and admin costs that is effectively waste. Next is your stocking capability. So material type. So a, a big. So what should we stock? Okay, we're only we're only going to catalog spares, consumables. We're not going to worry about because we use punch out catalogs, things like that. And that uh, that I can't define for you. That's a strategy you need to understand. Now consumables. Um, if if you're an SAP, you think consumables are high B materials, and spare parts are your urses. So forgive me if you're not an SAP. Um, and that's an important designation because consumables can be diesel, oil, right down to PPE for gloves and glasses. Let me just do a time check here. Okay, I need to get moving. Um, then we have risks to the business, and this is very much on the maintenance side, is um, the risk and the cost of not having parts can be very high. So that is a big influence. Then there's the financial. Can your company afford what you think you need to stock. And you know, maintenance people want to stock a lot more than generally finance says we can afford. And that's that's a constant argument to understand because it it, it costs a lot of money in, um, to carry spare parts. And that comes back to holding cost or carrying cost. I think I'll touch on that in a minute. So when should materials be added to the catalog is another one to think about. Now, me being a data person and using you know ERPs, mostly SAP for the last 25 years. I'm always, a, if, if you don't know, catalog it. Because then you're, you're, you're pulling in data and you have that information to pull on, especially if you have a structure on the governance and compliance. If you don't, then that, that's where the noise comes from. If you're not controlling your data, well, then you're gonna add, add to the noise. If you're controlling your data, you're adding value. So very important point. Um, the next one is around, the function of the department. So who, who has the influence? So I've, I've seen it all. I've seen finance on the indirect materials. I've seen obviously maintenance and engineers on the, the working in capital or the spare parts down to supply functions that own it. So it's, that makes a big difference on how the dictionary is created and when it's created, what's cataloged. But if you think about the last question, so if you employed a best in class processor tool to manage your master data, how would this change that conversation? So, so many companies do things manually 
and difficultly. So that changes the conversation. So the more you answer these, these four W's and the one H, come back to this because once you understand it and then you think, well, I need, I need better best in class processes with a tool that can help me do this. And then it changes everything because it's managed effectively. Okay, where? This has been a hot topic probably for the last, oh, depending on the industry, um, 10 ish years. You know, do we, do we offshore? Do we onshore? If I offshore, there's a miss, there's, you know, that things get lost in translation. And, um, but it comes down to, well, what are the drivers? What's driving the question? So is cataloging expensive? Are the resources onshore if you're in North America versus having a lot of cataloging is done in India? What's the cost driver? And then you linking the request to the information supplied from the offshore vendor can be difficult. It can also be good. Um, what level of quality? So the, the, there is enrichment, but then there's quality. So who's looking at, I've sent off a material to be cataloged. Um, I've given the noun modifier, but now I need the classification and the attributes added. And what quality do I get back? And that depends on your dictionary and what you consider as mandatory or optional requirements. Speed. So it comes back to when I mentioned your demand with planned versus unplanned demand. So if you have a lot of unplanned demand, if you're going to be cataloging, you're going to have to do it damn quick. And that reduces your quality and comes at a higher cost. But still, you should need to catalog. And it, it changes the conversation again and saying like, we need to be better at this. So think about the speed in terms of where. So you can do things with tools in-house and have things enriched as a separate step. So those of you that are in this space, you understand that everything is linked back to the number that you're creating. Once you have that, you have that visibility and availability. You can enrich it and finish it later, but work through the catalog. Okay, how are we doing on time? I'm gonna keep moving. Next, okay, so why? Why, am I, why do we need to catalog things? Now, this is a question that gets uh, asked usually by the senior management. They don't understand it. They just see the cost input going into um, the people and the resources. I've got all these people in the warehouse. I've got all these inventory planners. I've got all these maintenance planners. Why, why do I need to do this? Why can't I just have the vendor do it for me? These type of questions come up. So these are the things you need to understand clearly and concisely so you can influence up, down, and your peers. So always cost. Everything, if you're a for-profit organization, you need to understand cost and have that ability to influence finance. So the first thing that I do usually going to a company is help them calculate what is your carrying cost. Some people call it your holding cost. If you do not know, 25% at a minimum. Most companies are higher than that. Uh, when I went to a company recently, we calculated it at just under 20% because they were scared of the number they were getting when I showed them what it, I, th I thought it really was, which was higher than 25%, and it scared them. So your carrying cost is, is two key components. Your WAC rate, which is your weighted average cost of capital, and generally that's around between you know, 7 and 10%. That's what a company expects to make on its investment. And the other half is everything else. So that's your warehouse, your elect electricity, your infrastructure, your resources, your damage, pilferage, obsolescence, all that goes into the second half. So if we say your carrying cost is 10%, your, the other half of it is gonna be at least 15%, and that depends on the industry. I've seen things much higher. And so that, if you wanna get their attention, work with them to define your carrying cost. Risk. So maintenance obviously, are very, they are worried about keeping the plant running or keeping equipment running. And their, their focus is on, I need visibility and I need to know availability of parts at all times. And that's very important to them. So that, hence why catalog. To give them visibility availability, they need materials cataloged and they need to know what's my procurement master data. So when can I have it? Do, do I have it? And if not, when can I have it? And again, that comes back to your functions capability. How, how effective are your purchasing teams? How reliable are your inventory team on processing requests and, and what's the quality of the warehousing that you have of parts? Um, once you have things, things need to be maintained, preservation activities, things like that. So 
very much this is an important one. And the, the end. So how? How do I get materials cataloged? These seem like silly questions, but for the, those of us that have been in this space for a while, it's not so easy. It's, I like to think of this, this statement at the bottom. I've been quoting this for many, many years because it makes a lot of sense. And a lot of companies are very, very change adverse. And so I like this, you know, if we always do what we've always done, we're always gonna get what we've always got. So I'm a change agent. I like to think everything can be improved, but really the how is defined once you've answered all your whys, because then it becomes very clear whether, do I need a tool? Do I not need a tool? Do I need a catalog? Do I not need a catalog? Once you have that, you're going to get much more structure around how do I do it? Do I need additional resources? Do I need a tool? Do I not need a tool? Um, do I need consulting help to bring in ECMA kind of stuff or do I hire somebody to do that? Uh, and that depends on the industry. Like mining, huge number of, um, of SKUs, massive inventory holdings, hundreds of millions of dollars um, on single sites uh, like utilities, oil and gas, heavy industry will always be in much need of cataloging um, MRL materials. Every, every company does really. You always need spare parts. So this is something to consider the how, I think will we'll shape as you do the four Ws. So that puts us at, oh, look at that. I'm just one minute over 30 minutes. Um, I hope I've given you enough to think about in terms of setting the four whys, because we all get so busy. I've been doing this for you know 25 years in the MRO space and we get buried within the noise. And I'm hoping that if you can take a step back and just think about the four W's to define the H, then you'll help de define, okay, I need this dictionary. I don't know what's mandatory, what's not. How do I catalog something? Um, do I put material numbers in the, if it's an OEM, do I include the material number in the description or do I not? That is one that comes up all the time because the OEM won't supply me the characteristics. So this is where ECMA comes in and hopefully we're gonna use ECMA to start breaking that down a little bit because really when you catalog it, you're cataloging what you need, not necessarily always what the vendor supplies because you can get a part from four different vendors and that's important. If I'm gonna get a bearing, what do you need to run your plant for that bearing? Do I need to know the material the material that makes the bearing. I need to know the inner diameter. I need to know the outer diameter. Everything else, I don't care. It's, it's optional, it's nice to have. If it's sealed or not for my environment, I don't care. So that needs to be defined in your dictionary. So that assists your procurement team when they're gonna go and find you what you need, they have that information. And this is a lot what gets lost in the translation of cataloging. So we promise we're gonna keep these short and sweet. Um, is a bit of teasers so that hopefully within the Q&A you guys have either things you want to know more of or you have questions that hopefully I can answer and I will do my best to do that. Um, so let's go into that now. So we've got, okay, so we've got a, I've got a question here. Let me do my best to read this out and I'll answer what I can. Here we go. Um, is there any standard guidance for uh, qualitatively managing spares with regards to their link to criticality, functional location, ABC codes? Uh, and as they link to the, the functional location bill of materials, for example, a, a rubric of degrees of criticality along with guidance for stocking strategies, number of critical equipment linking to spares via the bomb. Okay, so this is this good question. This is a... Um, Jim, sounds like you're very deep into the detail, which is great. The demand generation, as I mentioned kind of earlier, this is, that is what drives your processes and your strategies downstream from the, your procurement capability and to your stocking strategies. If those aren't linked, you have a problem. For one, anything in your warehouse that's a spare part, if it's not in a bomb, why do you have it? In, and in most cases, that, that, that doesn't happen. Because if somebody's gonna go looking for a part, and if it's not in a bomb, they typically say, well, we don't have one, I'm gonna free text it and go get a new one. So this linkage to criticality, 
Criticality, oh God, that's probably another webinar in itself. Criticality is a difficult one because there's a lot of emotion wrapped around criticality of spare parts. If you're the me mechanic or in Asia Pacific, they say fitter, that's responsible for a piece of gear or equipment. What's critical to that person is very different to what's critical to maybe engineering or somebody that's looking after a bigger piece. So removing the emotion is a really important piece in terms of understanding this function location and all the associated equipment and the ABC codes need to drive my stocking strategies and that needs to be linked. Uh, for example, I many years ago I actually generated a criticality calculator and it was based on three main core bits of information, which was what's the impact of failure? If this piece of gear fails, what's the impact? Next was, well, what's the frequency of failure? So either experienced frequency or expected frequency of failure of this piece of gear. And the next, the third was the lead time. If I don't have it, when can I get it? So this puts it into like of a cube matrix with safety and some other things built in to help us remove emotion. And it was interesting when we did this and, and passed it to the business, they loved it, but it was, it was ironic that it was never as critical as they wanted it to be. And that was the learning says, okay, the business has agreed to the settings that we've built into this calculator. It's just not as critical as you want it to be because you want to stock three in the shelf when maybe we only need one or do we need none? Because I can get this within two hours versus, I'll give you an example, um, North America, remote is a very different question compared to let's say Australia. So working in Australia, remote is very remote where it takes two days to get to a site versus remote in North America, maybe let's say, let's talk US, Canada is probably a bit different. There's definitely remote in Canada. But I went to one of um, the company I worked for, their most remote plant in North America was an hour and a half from Denver in Wyoming. And that's what they considered remote. So you can imagine what they needed to stock and hold on site was very, very different than in the middle of the Pilbara where they do iron ore mining in Australia, very different. And so, th but that impacts on that criticality calculator. So Jim, I don't know if I've, I've answered uh, that in the detail you need, but I hope that helps. Um, defining criticality is a problem with every single business I've been in. And it's gotta be, it has to be an agreed um, process. And what I like to do, the spare parts are a slave to the criticality of the equipment. The equipment drive what we stock when we stock it and why we stock it. So like an RCM process I find is best is going through your equipment. What are the parts? What are the wear parts? What's the criticality of this gear? Do I have redundancy? Do I not have redundancy? That drives the decision on what you stock and when you stock it. And also the master data linking to your procurement. Okay, I hope I answered that. Um, Next, uh, I have another question around uh, what factors decide how much stock has to be maintained? Okay, so think that's, that's another good question. And this really affects the, the inventory management and the working capital. And it kind of comes back to what we just mentioned. A lot of heavy industry or spare parts are driven by risk. Cost is not so much depending on the industry and the wealth of the company, but it says, this is a necessary evil. I need to hold these materials in stock because we can't afford not to. It may cost 50,000, but if I don't have it, it'll cost me $100,000 per day, that type of scenario. And that's, that's generally the argument that's thrown around um, liberally from the maintenance and engineers. And that's an understanding that I have a lot of empathy for that space, but we can't stock everything. So this drives us back to um, the first question around equipment criticality that will drive what we stock. How much you stock, that is, has different factors. How much is usually driven a lot by vendor performance, lead time, and maybe do you have multiple vendors? Is it OEM, is it not? Can I get this from multiple vendors? And that becomes a, a calculation effectively. Really, it should be another one. I, I don't like to see people just thumb sucking for lack of a better term. 
numbers that can be a start but really we need to use statistics one thing i didn't touch a lot on is um is a, is a pet hate of mine is free text these free text materials are invisible um, they get we call them squirrel stores they get squirreled around site so people have things when they need them and that that's dangerous because that means the total demand is not seen and that impacts on how much we stock so i hope that helps um, at this stage there's no more questions uh, please if there's any other thing that you'd want a, a topic that you'd want discussed or for future webinars um, please just list it in the um, the q a section and we will look at you know adding that to our webinar series for future talks with that um, uh, let me go to let me close this down and i think we can hand this back over to isha so i'll oh, start isha what's next so we haven't set the dates for the next one but we've uh, part two is around standardization part three we've got um, as i just mentioned is the reduction of our free tech spend um and as, as i mentioned i think the last question was this on stocking strategies so we'll talk a lot around how much should you stock where should you stock it when should you stock it kind of a, kind of an approach because uh, that's very much cash focused and procurement procurement talks a lot around category management category management their job is to negotiate better prices but there's a whole world of what i say there's procurement and then there's purchasing purchasing is transactional procurement is negotiation uh, more commercial and so a lot more work needs to be done in the purchasing space to make that more automated as i mentioned driving towards more perfect orders for things that move the most so we'll look at talking about those if there's anything else one thing i i think that we probably need more information and in around here around asset management probably as well in terms of that linkage into the material master data so that's all i have today so isha i'll let you um yeah, thank you so much, Tim, for your time and the awesome presentation which you just gave. So I would like to ask again, if somebody have any questions, please go ahead with the same. Otherwise, we'll wrap up. So okay, I sorry. think uh, nobody has any questions. So, so I think we are good to go. And as soon as we decide the dates of our next webinar will circulate the same with everyone so thank you so much everyone for your time see yeah, you next thanks time thanks very much yeah bye bye thank you